Are you ready to manage your work and personal world better to live a fulfilling, productive life? Then you've come to the right place. Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. Here are your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwix. Welcome back, everybody, to Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things personal productivity. I'm Ray Sidney Smith. And I'm Augusto Pinaud. I'm Francis Wade. And I'm Mark Gelwix. Welcome, gentlemen, and welcome to our listeners to this episode. We are going to do something fun. A few times per year, the Productivity Cast team comes together to share with you a few software products and services uh, that we know or use in our personal productivity systems or with our clients systems. Uh, We call these productivity appapalooza. And we do this in three rounds with each of us taking the opportunity to explain the tool, to explain the tool and why we believe it provides value to our productivity and possibly yours. With that, here's productivity appapalooza fourth edition and so for round one ding 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 art you're up geez why do i have to start okay it's alphabetical <laughs> uh, see this is the curse of being the a so anyway uh, oh, sorry augusto <laughs> when we started to look at apple palooza round four i'm like oh okay i gotta find something that's good and i realized that i have something that i use all the time it's called journey and It is a journaling app. Now, a lot of people will do journaling in whatever their organization, organizational tool that they have is. Some do OneNote, some do Notion. I use Journey for a couple of reasons. One, it's available on the web and on mobile, so you can journal into it whenever you want. Second, you can do images into it as well, stacked multiple images. And third, it has its own pin code so that your information is protected. And that's one of the the struggles with journaling is if you want to be honest with yourself in journaling, you want to be truly honest and open. Well, then you're hesitant. It's like, well, where's this stuff going? Who's going to see it? Where's the access to it? And I just like the user experience, the consistency, the availability of the app on multiple platforms. It's just a nice way if you're trying to do that mental dump uh, and it's not really organization. It's just get this out for the day. I found it's probably the best tool out there for me. There's a couple others. Day one's another one. Didn't really care for it, but Journey to me is the one that I recommend. I use Journey also, and I do that first, and then I just copy and paste that over to my reference system. And so I keep it in both places, and it's a little bit of extra work, and I've thought about how to automate that using some scripting. And I really do like Journey. I like the ability for it to, on mobile especially, it auto-detects whether you're sitting, whether you're walking around, mm-hmm. and being able to capture capture in those multiple opportunities when you are alone and or just have thoughts and you want to be able to share them with yourself. So I really like Journey. All right, next up, Augusto. The first app that I have is Overcast. And... You know, as a person, as you are listening to us into a podcast, uh, you may have played with one or two. Overcast has been the, the software I've been using on on my iOS for, for a really long time. And I like the fact that I can not only download the episode, but create a smart list of the things that I want to have priority as well as increase the speed, as well as decide, you know what, for this podcast, download every episode, but for this other podcast, download only the last one. So it gives me a lot of customization power. So it's a piece of software that I have really, really enjoyed for a long, long time. Yeah, I've not played as much with Overcast. The name of the developer, Mark Arment. Arment, yes. He's, He's very active in that podcasting space and in probably Mm -hmm. other there are other things that he does in in the space but yeah i I think that overcast is great and a lot of people of course talk about pocket casts i still am actually a really big fan since transitioning over to google podcasts and the google podcasts app just really does everything i want a podcast app to do and uh, it's exciting to see that the space is expanding to have so many other podcast applications that you can use and do different things i've seen ones that capture audio clips so you can note uh, annotate the audio clips of a podcast and share those with friends and family uh, i think there, there's some really good things happening in the podcast space wonderful uh, overcast is a great option francis you're next so my first app is called save my time and it's an innovative solution for people who track their time 
and I've always tracked my time. And there are, there are things out there like toggle and other kind of manual methods for rescue time, trying to track how you spend your time. But this one has a difference. It's tied into the, your, your uh, not your screensaver, but when you turn your device back on, when I turn my phone back on, it immediately pops up. How did you spend the last X number of minutes since the last update? And so you can't avoid it. And it offers you a, a set number of options to choose from, nice diagrams. And you can add an, an, an any other number of categories of ways you could spend your time. So it's unavoidable because you're turning on, off your, on and off your phone all day long. You can signal when you're about to change and move into a, a different context or a different activity by just simply. But the, the tie-in between the natural behavior of turning on your phone and the artificial behavior of tracking your time, I think they call it habit stacking, is brilliant. So I've kept the best notes, and I've been time tracking since I think the 90s, late 90s, long time. But the quality of my time tracking has all of a sudden gone through the roof because I'm able to, not, not quite passively, but I'm able to trigger the capture of my spent time in this very intuitive way. It, it just, it's just brilliant. Is it mobile only? I, had, I haven't tried it on, on PC or laptop. And when I, I went to the website, and I, I, I only pay attention to the mobile version, so I think so. Great, and it looks like it's about three dollars USD per month billed annually, or five dollars USD billed monthly if you stay monthly. And otherwise, you can do the free version, which gives you up to nine activities. What are activities? Um, those are the the different categories that you assign your time to. Great, and then it allows for what it calls limited history. I don't know what that limited history is. Do you know what the um, limited I'm history is? Yet, so. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. Well, and and so professional gives you data export, export, right. calendar integration, and a custom date picker if you upgrade to the paid plan versus the the free plan. And so I that's upgrade, great. I upgraded and, as soon as I got it because I was I, I immediately saw the time savings because I spend for me to reconstruct my the last few days or weeks which is sometimes what, what happens because I haven't, it takes me a long time. I have to go to screenshots and I have to go to the manic time, which tracks the app usage and I have to reconstruct the whole, it's like a, it's a whole adventure. <laughs> I can't remember half of it. Yeah, it's for, it's forensic in nature. Yeah, it's awful, but this is, I've, I've already started to be, rebuild some of the days that I've tracked using the app. And of course I'm way more detailed. This is, this is brilliant, and I wish I had thought of something like this. <laughs> it's brilliant. That brings us to me. My first choice in round one is something that I feel like everybody should know, but maybe doesn't know, and that is Google Forms. Google Forms is a survey tool, a questionnaire tool that is built into your Google account. It's within the Google Drive space, and there are so many uses to Google Forms in a productive capacity. One is just like with Francis, where he's using uh, Save My Time, you can actually do time tracking directly in Google Forms by tying a Google Forms form to a Google Sheets workbook. And so you can just have the Google Forms form open on your machine, give yourself the ability to enter as many times as you want, you know, basically repeating entries and have a singular you know, block where you just complete what is it that you completed and the amount of time, uh, say, that you uh, have associated with that thing. And so I actually set something up like this several years ago just to t test it out. And it was incredibly useful. I'm just having it available on your phone, having it available on your phone, on your, uh, your, on your desktop, anywhere you are, you can really just capture the data into the system. And of course, I moved over to Toggle as Francis uh, mentioned Toggle earlier, as my time tracking tool. But when I was using Google Sheets as my primary vehicle for time tracking, I had moved from tracking in Excel to then tracking in Google Sheets. And that was just an easy transition for me. And I decided, oh, you know what? I could actually do this as a form. And so I actually 
created that Google Forms form, and that was great. And uh, and so if you just want to keep everything inside of your Google account and don't want to have to have another tool uh, and, and go to something like, you know, Toggle or, or otherwise or save my time, uh, you know, Google Forms is actually a really, really great tool in that particular use case. But there are other ways in which you can use it productively. For example, you can set up your own tests. So for example, say that you're trying to learn French or you're trying to do other kinds of things. You can create, in essence, flashcard style uh, tests within Google Forms. You can you can create questionnaires for friends and family to poll people in terms of when you'd like to go uh, to the movies. You can do all kinds of fun things, uh, you know, well, when we go back to having movies in, <laughs> in real life. Uh, but uh, we, we can do all kinds of polls and other types of question type answers. You can embed forms within a web page, and that's really helpful if you have a, a use in a business case. And you can even have people upload documents into a Google Forms form so that you can actually have those things uploaded as well. So you have lots of flexibility with Google Forms, and it's free. It's a part of your Google account, and I always uh, recommend it as a first line of being able to do that kind of questionnaire survey, but as well as just uh, giving form to a data entry environment so that you can actually structure the data entry well. Because sometimes looking at a Google uh, Sheets workbook or a Microsoft Excel workbook, that that sheet environment isn't the most pleasing. Plus, you can't necessarily give... Uh, details. You know, you can ask yourself questions and put those details in the in the uh, question, and that way you can actually answer them correctly. So with that, ding, 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 that is round one and brings us to round two of our Appapalooza, our productivity Appapalooza. And so with that round two, Art, you're up. All right. This one is a replacement keyboard. Uh, it's for mobile devices, specifically on Android. Uh, it is called Flesky. F-L-E-S-K-E-Y. Um, it's similar in design to like the Google keyboard and all the other ones, but I like this one because it has a couple of gestures built into it. It's very responsive. It allows you to do things like, you know, do the GIF searches and actually do voice dictation in to record and um, have the text transcription. But it has two gestures that I have learned to lo absolutely love. One is across the center of the keyboard as you're typing. If you make a mistake on a word, if you just swipe across the center row of the keyboard, it will delete the last word you typed in. Quick, easy, knock it right out. The second thing is if you swipe from the center of the keyboard up, it'll grab the first autocorrect in the autocorrect line and drop that into place. Now, you would think that's not really that big of a deal. I have found that just the way it's designed and the controls my typing is more accurate with Flesky than it is on any of the other keyboards I use. Um, Flexi. The, uh, Flexi. Flex. Flexi? Flexi, yeah. I thought it was F L E S K Y. Mm -mm. That's F L E A F L E K S Y. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. What he said. So <laughs> it'll be in the show notes. So luckily, there's an autocorrect for the name of the freaking product. So. Anyway, that capability coupled with the mic option so that you can actually do text to speech or speech to text on it is nice because it's speech to text goes through Google's capability and it actually pops it into a, you know, press to talk button. So I actually will have the keyboard sitting up, you know, taking notes on my phone on a little stand and I'll just tap it and type and verbally type something in and stop. So I don't even have to pick up the phone to type it. So that combination of features, while well, again, it's, it's just a keyboard, it's a keyboard that, that has actually made my text entry more productive. So whatever it's called, that's the thing I think you should try. Fantastic. Yeah. So Flexi and I really like Gboard, and I will just insert this again to say that Gboard is the Google keyboard application. You can install that cross systems. So for example, I have the Gboard application on my iPad. I have it on my Chrome OS devices. I have it on my mobile phone. And so I'm you're able to use Gboard across those. Is Flexi cross-platform? Does anybody know? I don't know that you can use Flexi on iOS, but I know you can install it on a Chromebook if you want to. Fantastic. That's great. I'm going to, I'm just going to visit flexi.com very quickly to make a note. Yeah. 
it's downloadable from the App Store. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so it is available on the Google Play Store as well as in the Apple App Store. So it looks like just like Gboard, you can install Flexi on and across uh, your operating systems, which is fantastic because I'm going to go do that now. <laughs> so. Yeah, one of, one of the things for those of you who are metrics geeks, there is a badges and stats section of the app that will tell you um, how many typos it's corrected, how many keystrokes it's saved, and your typing proficiency or efficiency rating. So how much it's gone up by using Flet, uh, Fletsky. Fles Fleski. I will never get that right. Let's just be clear. <laughs> so, Not to worry. Not to worry. Wonderful choice. All right. Next up, Augusto, what is your round two choice for Productivity Appapalooza? So I have two apps. So I'm going to cheat on this round two. Uh, the first one is the mind map application I use on my Mac as well as my iPad, and it's my note. And it is a great application. It's synchronized across everything and it works incredibly. But one of the things that I learned working with Ray was why when you want to do or collaborate on a mind map, and it is really powerful, not for everybody. You need to work with persons who think on a certain way and, and are comfortable with mind maps. But if you find people who are comfortable with that, there is a piece of software called Mind42 that basically works on any browser, but allows real-time collaboration on mind maps. And it is, in, if you are working with people who, again, can work with, on, on mind maps or likes to work on mind maps, it is super, super powerful and really, really great. There is a... A f some kind of fee associated with Mind42 if you want to upgrade to remove ads, but otherwise Mind42 is actually free. And I've actually paid for the lifetime license just because I want Mind42 to be around a while. And uh, so if you do end up using Mind42, it's really nominal to buy the lifetime access. I, mean, I, I don't know what I paid for it, but it was very, very in inexpensive. And it then takes away all of the advertising forever and just gives you that palette where you're able to uh, take any node, any thought, and attach tasks, images. You can attach another mind map, so you can actually tie one mind map to another in Mind42. Mind42 also allows you to export into a bunch of different mind map files, so you can import them and export them out of the system. And I actually like to do that because I like to download the mind map into my mind mapping software locally and then upload it back to Mind42 if I need to. And so just really, really great tool. What, what are the differences, if you, if you happen to know, Augusto, what the difference is between, say, Mind Node and Simple Mind? What what do you feel like are the, are the defining comparison features between some of the other more popular mind mapping software? I move from MindJet to MindNote um, many years ago. I'm I tend to 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 stay on software for a long time. Apparently, um, since <laughs> somebody mentioned that to me the other day, that I tend to pick a software and stay there, and and and, and that is true. I believe you you pick the software and learn it really well instead of trying to go from software to software. So I cannot tell you at least not a recent comparison of those. I've been on my note for a long time, at least over a year, maybe more. So I, I don't know to these days what are the features difference between those. For me, the big deal when I got it was the synchronization between I have two iPads and I need the things to synchronize between them without me thinking about it. So that was one of the big things my note did add to the Mac on that equation and my note could do those three things and that was enough for me to jump into that i can't speak more highly of mind mapping just generally as a mechanism for being able to do all kinds of things you can journal you can brainstorm you can collaboratively uh, take notes you can take notes uh, individually there's so many different uses for mind maps and so uh, mind note is a great choice in and amongst that all right next up francis francis what is your round two choice my second choice is Zenny Optical, which is an app that you use to buy glasses. And this is courtesy of Art, because I'd never heard of anything like this. And he shared with us a few months ago that he just bought a couple of pairs of glasses for I think it was maybe 150 bucks or 120 bucks. And I, I, my immediate response was, 
it must be illegal, immoral, or fattening because there's no way. Because in my mind, you know, glasses cost like 400, 500 bucks and they involve various degrees of pain and, and mishap and all the rest of it. So I haven't replaced my glasses for years. I've replaced the lens, but not, not the glasses themselves. But anyway, so I, I trusting art, I went online and the app that you use to design or pick your glasses on Zenny Optical is just mind blowing. And both my wife and I, you know, we took our, not just take a picture, but they actually take a, a composite, create a composite video of your head moving from left to right. And uh, once the picture is taken, once the video is made, they superimpose the glasses over your head so that you can see what you actually look like like wearing hundreds of different options of, of glasses. So you get a far, and, and wait, you get way more time, you get a far better look at what you actually look like in the glasses once they're done. And you know, compared to the, the, the walking into a store and getting two seconds to look at five different ones or whatever number they actually have that look decent, you, know, you could spend weeks, months looking at hundreds if you really wanted to. So anyway, we spent a couple hours and ordered them, and they arrived here in Jamaica about, about two to three weeks after. There's a 30-day refund policy. So the, the product is, is awesome, but it's not mind-blowing. You know, it's, it's affordable glasses, no name brands, no famous anything, um, but lots of choices. And it's the process enabled by the app that I really want to highlight the innovation that they've made in choice and purchase and options and really all you're putting in is a prescription and then you go to town so that's the that's the real innovation that's what i found really admirable the whole experience was just flawless and just just wonderful my, my glasses came yesterday and I'm, I'm really happy with them so i think there's going to be lots of lots of new apps like this that just just transform the way you think that you have to purchase or consume uh, an item. And it, it, they're, they're just transformational. I'm sorry for those who are selling glasses in traditional stores at this point because they're going to really have a tough time. They'll need to pivot. They'll need to you know, adapt and uh, adopt new technologies in order to be able to stay in the market. And that's the nature of the game, right? It sure is. There is another shirt. Um, there's a shirt app out there that does this for dress shirts. Really? And if I if I remember the name, I, I will put this into the show notes. But the idea is is that you do the same thing. You kind of hold up your phone, uh, snap some photographs, or have. I'm presuming you have to have someone take the photographs of you for that to even be useful. But then it. Uh, it goes ahead and tailors the shirts to your sizes because it knows uh, it, it's you know taking this 3D uh, you know kind of imagery of you and that's really powerful. I mean that's that's great. I'm, Takes I'm looking a forward to it. Picture of you or an ideal picture of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's got to fit you, so it's got to be realistic. So the shirt's so. <laughs> gonna the shirt's going to um, you know be tucked in places and bulge in places where it needs to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, mean, see, I was interested on the on the other part. As soon as you said realistic, it just scratch it out of my list. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the I have a, I have the trouble with you know uh, you, you know everybody kind of makes fun of me, but you know finding shirts that are uh, you know tailored thin enough for me, and uh, you know I happen to be an ectomorph and uh, endomorph ectomorph, which is it? I don't know. Anyway, I happen to have a the the slimmer build and it's very difficult for me to find shirts that are not just billowing you know from the sides you know like i i raise my arm and there's a there's a a sail that appears and so uh you know then i have to take it to the tailor and have them pull in the sides so that i can actually have a normal uh fit and uh slim fit is not truly slim fit uh not in not in the united states at least um they're they're slim fit uh for people who want to feel like they are slim fit not for people who are actually slim and so these types of shirt companies that can allow for uh, really tailored shirts at an affordable price uh, to be quite honest uh, one thing that i i could just al always offer to folks is that most of the time when i take a shirt to be tailored to, to have them um, trim it down 
it's really inexpensive. I don't know why people think that tailoring shirts is uh, all that expensive. You can take them to your local dry cleaner if they have a, a tailor, and they'll they'll pull those the signs in. They'll shorten, lengthen cuffs, those kinds of things, and it's really nominally priced. So I don't really understand that. But either way, it's really nice to have the convenience, like you're talking about, uh, Francis, to be able to just you know scan and now that's kind of set in the system and then any shirt that you buy after that is now going to be in their system so it's really easy to purchase from yeah those of us who use those types of apps and we'll go through and scan it and the app immediately goes oh you want a hawaiian shirt <laughs> like dude come on <laughs> All right. Uh, so thank you, Francis. And uh, to close out, uh, to close out round two, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite services, which is Fancy Hands. And so Fancy Hands is a company owned by Ted Roden, and uh, he's the CEO of Fancy Hands. And what Fancy Hands does is gives you, uh, in essence, short tasks that can be handled by virtual assistants, and they are capable of doing anything that you can on the computer in essence. And you can even put your payment information in there and they can make purchases on your behalf. They can make restaurant reservations. They can do all kinds of, uh, of things, research. They can phone uh, people, all kinds of you know virtual assistance services. And the pricing works out to be uh, roughly about five to $6 per request, depending upon how many requests you uh, ask for every month. And you can scale it up and down you know, based on your needs each month, which is really nice. And so I, I just really, you know, I enjoy using Fancy Hands. It's a great service. And the, um, the other point is that I have a sign up link from, uh, from Fancy Hands from Ted Roden, and it gives you 50% off your first month or 5% off your first year if you buy like the annual plan, I guess. And so I'm guessing I get some kind of credit in the system, but that doesn't matter to me. But if you want 50% off your first month or 5% off your first year, use the link that's in the show notes because why the heck not? And so, but yeah, I can't speak more highly of Fancy Hands. It's just a really great service. They have a pool of assistance. So you actually put the pool of assistance you you basically put your task into the system through iOS, Android, email. There's even a, an ability to record directly into the app your request. You can go into the web app and type it in. That's where I mostly do my uh, requests. And then someone picks it up and then they say, ask any questions that they need in order to be able to solve the problem and do the request. And then they go go to town. Each request is calculated up to about 20 minutes per task. So that's why they're kind of these little, not micro tasks, but they're, they're smaller tasks. They're not things that you want someone, you know, you're not going to go to Upwork or, or Fiverr to get someone to do ongoing work, that kind of thing. Uh, you can stack tasks. So you can say, I need this thing done. And so I need you to take three requests in order to get that done. And that'd be an hour's worth of work. But these are really for those, gosh, can you call the library and just deal with this, you know, overdue, you know, uh, book issue, which is my typical problems, uh, <laughs> which is like, no, I want to keep this book for another uh, couple weeks. And so that's something that easily uh, Fancy Hands can go ahead and take care of for you, which is just really, really great. So ding, 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 round two is complete. And that brings us around to round three of our productivity Appapalooza. And that is over to you, Art. What's your third round choice? Okay. This time I wanted to call out something that's top of mind for a lot of people, and that's social networks. Uh, there's a lot of kerfuffle around what should I use? What shouldn't I use? I'm not happy with the big ones. What it, so I want to call out one called Mighty Networks. Uh, I've used Mighty Networks for a long time. Uh, we actually here at Productivity Cast use Mighty Networks as, par, as the center for the personal productivity club. Um, Francis, I believe you use it as well. Uh, it is a privately structured um, social network. It is designed to allow you to go through and set up your own community, put your information in, and coordinate with other people, have chats, publish. I mean, Ray can talk to it just as much as I can, probably more so. Uh, but if it's something that you're looking to set up or participate in a topic-based community and you don't want to play in the normal spaces, this would be something that I would absolutely recommend. I'll add my voice to that. I've used, Art introduced me to Mighty Network and I've used it for all kinds of applications, conferences and communities and 
uh, training and they have, a, have an LMS built in now and it's, it's gone from strength to strength. Um, and it's, they, they now have a free version. So there's, there's no reason to not create an, a community of learners or fans of a particular product. Just lots of applications, especially know that if you're on a social network, you know, that the, you're exposed to all of the traffic from the rest of Facebook. If all you really want to be on is in a Facebook group, which is distracting. And also some people just don't want to be on the big networks like Facebook um, or, or Instagram or Twitter. So it's a, it's just a great, great application. Yeah, Art actually also introduced me to Mighty Networks, and I have fallen in love. I mean, for the things that it does, it does well, and for all of its limitations, I feel like that those are the things that the company themselves, Gina Bianchini of uh, formerly of Ning, uh, so you know, it's steeped in deep understanding and interest in community management and community development, and so she's aware. She leads a really great team of people who are just capable of of iterating on the substantial quality around community, right? It's a community focused application. So it's community first everything. So the the events on top of it is based on community. The the LMS, the the course platform is built on community. And there are certainly places where it can grow, but I have found it to just be such a stable space for us to be able to have that kind of community. And so I'm really happy to have Personal Productivity Club founded on that and actually run another one for my company. Uh, on Mighty Networks as well, and both of them I couldn't be more happy with in, in that regard. So if you are and need that in your company or in your world, Mighty Networks is definitely something to look at for. So thank you for bringing that up, Art. Augusto, what's your round two choice? My round two choice, it's an, a journal application called Day One. And I was, you know, as I was researching for this episode, I was like, oh, I have never talked about this. Or what is happening? We, I check and double check the list why I have not mentioned day one. Anyways, I've been using day one as my journal application of application of choice for a really, really long time. It works on the Mac. It works on the iPhone. It works on the iPad. It allows you to create multiple journals, allows you to upload images, videos, and a bunch of things. And it is really an incredible application. I recommend people who don't journal to journal. Journal is, in my humble opinion, one of the best ways to personal productivity and to improve uh, personally. So if you are looking for a place to journal, that may be an incredible option for you. So what is what is the difference that you find in say looking at something like uh, Journey versus Day One? What what do you see as the comparison for for listeners? Th this one's obviously Apple focused. So if you're an Apple user, this is clearly a little bit more Apple-y. This is completely completely Apple-y, Yes, um, I have never used Journey. So I you make me open Journey. Uh, I think Journey goes all on the cloud. There is, oh, it has Google, it has Apple stores. I, I'm not familiar with Journey, yeah. to be honest with you. I can jump um, in on it because I've used both. Good. Oh, you um, have both? Good. Yeah. It's And it's very much that. Day One very much has an Apple feel to it, has always had. It works really well on iOS devices, especially on the iPad. Used to use it on there a lot. Uh, it has a nice functionality when you go through and you're adding in imagery or you're adding in text prompts, it has a very clear visual display and it has a, it has a very clear visual style. Um, functionality wise, I don't think it necessarily has that much of a difference in functionality. Uh, for example, when you go in and you create an entry, you get the same sort of captures such as your location, the time, the weather, providing the map connection, uh, you do have the ability to share your posts, which are, which is kind of nice. Uh, but in both of them, it's really, it's really the visual difference. Uh, the only thing that I would say between the two, and this is again, just having the choice between them. If I was working in iOS and Android, I might be more inclined to use something like day one, because I don't know that journey on iOS looks quite as good. Um, I like journey because journey has the web interface too. And if I remember, I don't remember if day one has web or not, but it might, 
they're very close together in in capability. If you're looking at one, I would say look at the other two. Choose between them. Yeah, as you said, day one, day one, you know, they have really stay on the Apple ecosystem. They even have an uh, an app for your Apple Watch where you can record voices and text if you want to. Um, while Journey goes almost universal. I mean, they, with the browser, you're universal, but also they have apps for Windows, for Mac, for, for Apple. So it's, uh, I think, more important sometimes than than the app. And I think this applies to, to, to many of these things we mentioned in the Apple Palooza. It's not necessarily the app we're bringing. The app is something that we use, something that we like, something we have a good experience. But it's, think also further into the concept, you know, are you journaling and what you're using for that? And this may give you an idea to search and give now two apps where you can get a comparison. But the most important thing, my opinion, will not be if you use day one or journey or anything else, but the importance on on your on the journey on the journal part. Now one thing I did notice just jumping into it real quick. Day one has the cap- has two capabilities that I'm not seeing in Journey. One is the ability to have multiple journals. So you can create maybe a business journal and a personal journal if you wanted to, which is kind of nice. It also supports within its setting capabilities within Sync, the ability to uh, connect through IFTTT uh, to automate entries into day one, which again, if that's your thing, then that's your thing. Um, I think they're like one, one A within the market space. And they're definitely both worth it, worth a try. Yeah, I also like that day one can import your Instagram posts. So it can just automatically import your Instagram posts, which is a direct integration inside the day one app. I like I like some of the features there. Plus, if integration if integration would be a great, it would be a godsend for uh, Journey. Mm-hmm. They need to really add that so that you're able to suck posts from Journey. I just don't like the siloed data, which is why when we talked about it earlier in round one, I like that process of, uh, did we talk about round one or round two? Uh, round one. Round one? Yeah. Uh, well, we talked about it in round one because I like the ability to have my data not siloed. I purposefully write the post and then you know write the entry and then I copy it into my own system. And in this case, it's Evernote for me. And, and then I encrypt that text and there is inside of Evernote. And so I, I just like having that centralization of data and it's just, it would be so nice to be, able, to be able to have both views, right? One is the backup of the data, but the other is having journey uh, be the input point, which is really what I'm looking for. And I think that same thing is capable of being done in day one because you have that if yeah. integration. So one one nice feature of day one as well is that it has the ability to print photo books, if I understand. Mm-hmm. So it's capable of creating these uh, journal, journal entries. Uh, and uh, I kind of have done that same thing with Google Photos in the sense that, you know, you can create these. I've just created them all as drafts and they're sitting there. But the idea of having a a a series of photographs and then annotating those photographs so that you remember the trips that you might have taken or or you know big events that might have happened in your world and that gives you this kind of photographic chronology of what has happened and that's that's kind of nice and so day one allows you to to commemorate those memories in a in a in a book in a physical printed matter which could be a gift or just a memento for yourself yeah and then you can do that book printing with, with not only the pictures, but everything. And it's, they go directly, you go in the app, you know, you select the book printing and they start on around uh, $14.99. So they're not really, you know, incredibly expensive, but then you can build it from there, have the pages, you know, you can add Instagram pictures from there to add to the journals or just print the actual journal with the pictures and the text that you create. So if you say, hey, you know what, I want to, to you go to, for example, Art, who pre-pandemic used to travel, uh, you know, if he goes to the next Oktoberfest, he can create his journal for the Oktoberfest. And as soon as he's back, click on the app, print, and now have a book with all the memories, all the little things he collect and write through the journey. All right. Francis, what is your round three choice? I'm just in love with Google Authenticator. So I, I've interacted with a few companies, not a terrible number, who actually use it. And it's the antidote to that problem I've had. It was killing me of 
oh, we'll send you a text with the secret code that you need to input. And it just so happens that I'm, I live in a, a bit of a dead spot where some text messages just never get to me. So Google Authenticator gives me, of course, it has an instant code built in. So for those who haven't used it, it's a way of doing two-factor authentication. So it's a, a, the company sends, asks you to go into Google Authenticator, create a, uh, an account for them, essentially. And then whenever you log in, if they suspect or need further verification, they ask you to read off the number that's in Google Authenticator. They put it into their system and it verifies that you're the right, you're the true owner of the account. So it's a, it's a, a two-factor auth authentication system. The great part is that you do not have to rely on email, which is not secure, on SMS, which is not secure, that the, you're the only person who has that particular app dialed into your account on your phone. And I'm finding I'm having to ask companies who have the option whether or not I could, could I please use it? And they say, oh, yeah, sure. Because they're so used to sending text messages or sending emails that I often have to prompt them to actually use Google Authenticator. But for me, it solves so many security issues. And it works for, so far, it's worked flawlessly for me. So I, this was a brilliant. Dinner. And I, I hope more companies jump on the bandwagon and use it. Yeah, I can't speak more highly of Google Authenticator. And now with a recent upgrade so that you're able to have Authenticator on multiple devices so that you can actually synchronize accounts by exporting your accounts and putting them on to different mobile devices, you now can have the one-time passwords display in multiple uh, devices, which means that if you lose a device, you're not locked out of accounts, which was uh, kind of my big concern always with things. Not locked out permanently because you should be taking the backup codes that any service provides to you and saving those securely someplace, literally printing them and putting them into a clearly safe place from theft, water, fire, and uh, and that way you have those backup codes to reaccess those accounts in an inconvenient way, but in, from a just convenience factor, now being able to have Authenticator synchronized across multiple devices is just phenomenal, and I can't speak more highly of Google Authenticator. Now, if you are allergic to Google, just remember that Microsoft has their own Authenticator. Uh, if you want to be outside of the the big four tech, you can use LastPass Authenticator. Yeah, I use the LastPass one all the time. It just flat out works. I mean, that's really, and that's the only thing that I've consistently liked about the LastPass one, and I don't know if this is the case with Microsoft or Google's, is it has an, an easy function to restore, I think it's restore from the cloud. If you switch devices and you need to reinstall the two-factor authentication app, um, you don't have to go through a lot of steps. I actually set it up from my car the one day and it just flat out works. So. Yeah, because it's tied to the it's tied to the account, which is really, really helpful. And so that mm -hmm. synchronization is very helpful. Uh, but yeah, so so one password does have a one time mm -hmm. password authenticator built into it, uh, as I thought. And so, yeah, just everybody get multi factor authentication and certainly two factor using a an authenticator application it will secure your account so that passwords won't matter as much not that they don't matter but they won't matter as much as it relates to being able to uh, secure your especially your primary accounts i mean this is so important to be able to have that security so thank you for bringing that up francis and to round out round three and our appapalooza all together is my choice my choice this time around is going to be asana asana different than the yoga poses uh, asana is a project management software for uh, for teams and i use that in one of the divisions of my company but i also use it for managing all the personal productivity activities that I do. And the goal is to be able to just have a space to track those things. What I really like about Asana, you know, in, in difference to say Trello, is that the conversation functionality within Asana is just a little bit more fluid, a little bit nicer. I think that from an aesthetic perspective, uh, there is an aesthetic there that many people like about Asana. I happen to be a boards person. I like that Kanban feel of seeing cards and being able to physically move them in a virtual space. But I really do value the ability to have that seamless conversation and not be included in every conversation and the reduction in email by virtue of having that Asana comment thread really embedded within it. Now, I would like Asana to have a little bit better of capabilities in terms of copying and pasting and moving tasks and projects from one workspace to another and from one project to another. Uh, it seems a bit clunky to me yet that some of the data can't 
be copied and pasted over. Also, if you have multiple Asana instances, again, same thing with Trello or with some of these other applications where you're not quite sure what rights or features are missing or included based on which account you're in. And that can be sometimes frustrating. You know, it's like, oh, well, I have this automation functionality in Asana here, but I don't have it in this account because it's not upgraded. And uh, that just seems frustrating that you're paying on one part but and, and, and not paying on another. And so therefore you're blocked from the, the features. And so at some point, this is just going to have to be solved by all of the major project management software out there, which is how to make money, but also not block me from features when I'm paying for those features. And I, the individual, maybe the 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 other entities that own the instances, the, those accounts are not paying for them. But I just feel there's a, there's a diminished value feeling there as a consumer uh, that just needs to be solved. Uh, but otherwise, I've been very pleased with Asana for, since their very early days. And now there are Asana pros. Uh, these are uh, basically independent consultants who can help you with Asana implementations. And so if you go to asana.com, you can find the pros uh, place just like with Evernote. They have Evernote certified consultants. Uh, I happen to be an Evernote certified consultant. And then there are Asana pros who are basically independent consultants who can help you with Asana implementation training and other kinds of, of issues there for implementing it in your business. So very cool there. All right, gentlemen, that uh, closes us out for this productivity Appapalooza. Links to all the products and services that we talked about are on the episode page on productivitycast.net in the show notes. So if you want to find any links to those things or some of the other tools that we talked about around our primary choices, those are all there. Uh, while we are at the end of our Productivity Appapalooza 4th edition, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. If you have a question or a comment about what we've discussed during this cast, please visit our episode page on productivitycast.net. There on the podcast website at the bottom of the page, you can feel free to leave a comment or a question. We've been getting some, and that's fantastic, wonderful to see you all engaging. Uh, we read and respond if needed to every comment or question. Also, you can find us in our digital community that Art mentioned earlier, Personal Productivity Club, where we have a dedicated group to Productivity Cast. So if you visit productivitycast.net forward slash community, you'll be directed to Personal Productivity Club to join. And then you can go ahead and join the Productivity Cast group, which is under channels. Click on channels and you'll find our Productivity Cast group. If this is your first time with us, please consider adding us to your favorite podcast app, maybe Overcast, like Augusto noted. Uh, if you click on subscribe, on productivitycast.net, you'll see the instructions to follow us and get episodes downloaded for free every time a new one comes out. And if you've enjoyed spending time listening and learning with us today, it'd be a great help to us if you add a rating or review in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podchaser. Uh, your compliments motivate us to keep going, your feedback helps us get better, and those ratings help us grow the personal productivity listening community. So thank you to those who have left ratings and reviews. They're really helpful. We, uh, we've seen them and appreciate all the feedback and uh, keep them coming. I want to express my thanks to Augusto Pinaud, Francis Wade, and Art Galwix for joining me here on Productivity Cast each week. You can learn more about them and their work by visiting either the episode page or going to productivitycast.net and clicking on About. I'm Ray Sidney Smith, and on behalf of all of us, at Productivity Cast. Here's to your productive life. That's it for this Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity, with your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwicks.